Asante sana Madam Chair. Tafadhali let's take our seats. Thank you very much. Um, Your Excellencies, Governors, CSS present, Deputy Governors, PSS, Your Excellencies, Ambassadors and High Commissioners, our development partners, speakers of the National Assembly and the Senate, speakers of county assemblies, members of the Senate, members of National Assembly, members of county assemblies, staff of our national and county governments, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Hamjambo. Uh, let me take this opportunity to welcome all of you uh, to my hometown. Um, uh, just to give you a bit of geography, uh, I went to primary school, pre-primary school actually, about uh, 25 minutes drive northwest of here, and I went to secondary school maybe two minutes drive from here to uh, the school I went to there. And so, while I am here, I am a village boy. So welcome, uh, and I am truly, truly grateful that uh, the, the first devolution conference you have granted my home county and my hometown the honor to host. I am delighted to be with you today as we commemorate the 10th anniversary of the most transformative achievement of the radically progressive constitution that the people of Kenya gave to themselves 13 years ago this month. Our country's constitution-making journey covers many historic milestones of the struggle for a new dispensation for true political, social, and economic freedom and our collective quest for a nation to complete the journey begun by our forefathers who fought valiantly to resist colonial rule as well as our brave freedom fighters who sacrificed immensely to win sovereignty for our nation. In this journey, the people of Kenya engage each other across the country with courage and determination and negotiated relentlessly on the understanding that a new governance paradigm was absolutely necessary and in fact inevitable. As we reflect and remiss about constitution making, one thing becomes absolutely clear. In all the bargainings, horse trading, deal making and consensus building, that went into the various processes which contributed to the development of the drafts that formed the basis of the ultimate document, the citizens of Kenya were emphatic, persistent, and unequivocal about one thing, that decentralization, sharing, and devolution of power and resources was both overdue, and in fact, it was non-negotiable and that was agreed across the country. As the Latin proverb goes, the voice of the people is the voice of God. Based on this unambiguous imperative from the people, leaders exercised very limited authority to debate and negotiate the modalities of instituting effective devolution that would actualize the people's and most cherished aspiration of devolution. In other words, the question was never whether devolution would happen, but only in what form. The drive to devolve stemmed from the bitter experience of extractive colonial institutions, which invested heavily 
in the White Highlands and brutally neglected elsewhere. This practice found expression in the National Economic Planning and Development Policy promulgated shortly after independence, which formalized inequalities and marginalization and led to the emergence of zero-sum politics and gross inequality in the allocation of public resources that informed our early years of our nationhood. This resulted in underdevelopment and economic stagnation, weakening of nationhood through strained bonds of cohesion and common endeavor, and a torn social fabric. Kenyans knew what the problem was, and as well, they knew what was the cause. This is the reason for the unanimous insistence on decentralization and sharing across the country. I therefore recall engaging with my parliamentary colleagues over a, product, a protracted period about how many levels of decentralization there would be and how many territorial or geographical units of devolved governance we would need. Some people went for four levels of governance while others preferred only two an ambitious middle ground proposed three levels. Similarly, reluctant devolutionists campaigned for eight units to coincide with the administrative provinces, whereas others wanted 14 regions, yet others demanded numbers varying from 24 to 56. I happen to have been part of this history, and I, I am very privileged that I participated in this conversation. And I'm very happy that today we are celebrating 10 years of devolution. What was no longer subject of controversy or, sub or subject of canvassing was the principle and object of devolution. The people had been clear. And on 27th August 2010, Kenyans ratified a constitution which embedded devolution into the very definition of our republic under Article 6 that describes the territory of Kenya not only in terms of its boundaries but also accords or according to our counties. In Article 10, the Constitution also highlights sharing and devolution of power, democracy and participation of the people as well as equity social justice, inclusiveness, non-discrimination, and the protection of the marginalized as national values and principles of governance with preemptory implications for the exercise of constitutional authority by any person at any place at any time. Counties are therefore intrinsic to the constitution and proper definition of the Republic of Kenya. They exist to serve as platforms of actualization of the sovereignty of the people in several fundamental ways. They make state power more democratic and accountable and promote unity through diversity by arbitrating between competing political impulses towards disintegration on one, on one end and over-centralization on the other. Devolution also restored to the people their powers of self-governance and promoted their participation in the exercise of powers of state and in making of all decisions that affect them. Under devolution, our communities regained the right to manage their own affairs while the interests and rights of minorities and marginalized could no longer be ignored. Article 174F of the Constitution sets out what the Chair of the Council of County Governors, my dear sister there, Anne Mumbi Waiguru, correctly referred to as the role of county governments as the last mile implementers of critical development agenda, including the AU's Agenda 2063, 
the UN Sustainable Development Goals, Kenya's Vision 2030, and the bottom-up economic transformation agenda. It states that one objective of the devolution of government is to promote social and economic development and the provision of proximate, easily accessible services throughout Kenya, throughout Kenya, as is that of enhancing checks and balances and separation of power. To remove any doubt as to what Kenyans really wanted to do with the revolution, the Constitution sets out one object of devolution to be that of facilitating the central decentralization of state organs, their functions and services from the capital of Kenya. By design, devolution was destined to instigate unprecedented transformative change in every part of our political governance and development reality. It recalibrated our democracy, development, and reoriented policy making by simply redefining what was at stake at all times and handing over power to the people in their greatest number. This change was dramatic and a change management framework was essential to the smooth transition into the brave new world that we got ourselves into. Despite the efforts of the Transition Authority and the Commission for the implementation of the Constitution, the inauguration of devolution a decade ago was fairly noisy. And I know it because I have had the privilege of being the chair of IBEC since the first day we rolled out devolution until um, I changed jobs. Executives of both levels could not agree on mandates, each suspicious that the injury of losing functions would inevitably be followed by the insult of losing funding. Legislatures, too, had their friction. At the same time, county assemblies and executives had many a disagreement over respective authority and limits, while at the national level, the Senate and the National Assembly engaged in a tug of war over oversight and budgeting, making mandates, uh, budget making mandates, even as both eyed the national executive with restless suspicion. We were suspected by the National Assembly. We were also suspected by the Senate. So we didn't have many friends. The Council of Governors quickly emerged as a forceful champion of quick and total devolution, challenging elements in the national government which were still reluctant to let go of many powerful functions. I remember we had in the law a period of three years to transfer functions, but we transferred almost 90% of the functions in the first year. And many people thought we didn't make the right decision. With the benefit of hindsight today, I think we made the right decision to accelerate the devolution of functions because it gave county governments the opportunity to develop the capacities to be able to appropriate those functions and talk over their mandate. Those were very hard times because I remember them. But there were also times of fast learning and quick adaptation to relentless change. We discovered the limits of adversarial competition and zero-sum contests and recognized the power of alternative dispute resolution and patient consensus building. Article 189 began to make sense and to take shape of a very inspired consent as, 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 um, consent while the intergovernmental frameworks, intergovernmental budget and economic council, and the intergovernmental summit revealed their value because we managed to sort out many things using these frameworks in a negotiated um, way rather than taking things to court. Once everyone was finally clear that there 
were really, there were no losers, no winners in the transformation, and that devolution and Kenyans had won. Leaders at both levels of government finally got round to recognize the brilliant genius of the people of Kenya in never once doubting the power and the promise of devolution. Devolution has grown tremendously in a decade. It has matured from a delicate fledging with limited institutional capacity to administer resources, provide services, and generate own revenues to fully operational governments touching the lives of people at the grassroots undertaking ambitious development programs and driving economic growth. And we commend our county governments for the transformation that is visible in the Republic of Kenya. There remains much more to do, and many shortcomings are still evident. But only a serious, inattentive person would say today that devolution has no impact in any part of Kenya. And you have to be really ungrateful. Very often, many of the positive outcomes of devolution are evident to those who have observed our rural areas and formerly remote and neglected regions over time. I am particularly encouraged by what we have achieved in the areas of health, agriculture, education, infrastructure, trade, development, in the last 10 years of devolution. It is true that devolution has encountered setbacks owing to poor coordination, administrative rigidities, and inefficiencies, which have suppressed effective performance. At the same time, there remains capacity shortfalls, which also contribute to suboptimal performance and frequently poor to absent implementation of policies, programs, and projects. It cannot be denied that on the whole, the management of the equitable allocation framework can do with a timely and more efficient administration. Delays in disbursing allocation to counties have tremendous negative effects with which cascade all the way to the households at grassroots level, leading to poor outcomes in many sectors. There is no excuse for this, and we simply have to do better. As has been said here evidently, and as I made a commitment, there are three fundamental issues that inform this particular session. Number one, we made a commitment that we are going to analyze and frame all the remaining functions that are, being dis that are still being discharged by national government and transfer them to the counties. I am very happy that between the national government and the transition, uh, the, uh, the committee that is responsible for that job and the other stakeholders, we have finally agreed on the functions that should be transferred. An analysis is going on on the, on the funding that will accompany the transfer of those functions. And I am told that in the next 60 days, we should be able to transfer all the remaining functions to our counties. Number two, as was said by the Council of Chair, uh, the Council of the, the Chair of uh, the Council of Governors, um, being a strong believer in devolution and having made a commitment that we will do what is possible to make sure that we try to the extent possible to keep to the timelines of disbursing money that is due to counties. Two things have happened. Unlike last financial year where we crossed the year with about 30 billion due to counties, this year I did make sure that every cent that was meant for counties was paid before we closed the books for last year. And again, we have paid the July allocation on time. I intend to the extent possible to keep to this schedule so that 
counties can manage their issues, deliver on their mandate, serve the people at the grassroots, roll out their programs, implement their projects in a timely manner and in a way that benefits people at the grassroots. It is for the reason that I have managed to do that with my administration. We also gave a commitment to support the bottom-up economic transformation agenda by promoting stronger performance at grassroots through collaboration with county governments and enhancing the equitable allocation of the county governments from 370 billion in the 2022-2023 financial year to 385.4 billion in 2023-2024 financial year. The Equalization Fund was also allocated 8.3 billion, an increase of 1.2 billion in the scam and reduce over reliance of transfers from the national government. I will speak to that later. Further, we vowed to ensure that shareable revenue is transferred to counties in a timely and predictable manner and in accordance with the law. Finally, we undertook to transfer funds owed to beneficiary counties under the Mining 2016 and the Petroleum 2019 Acts and to collaborate with counties to increase the capacity of such counties to benefit from extractive resources, money that I have instructed to be disbursed this year. We recognize that the bottom-up economic transformation agenda will achieve its highest potential and lift up the highest number of people if we focus thoroughly on collaboration with county governments in order to empower them as the stewards of development at the grassroots or at the bottom as it were. I recognize the merit in demands for increased allocation of shareable revenue to counties. I also realize that even if devolution is by law a two-tire affair, it should in practice reach the lowest and smallest possible unit of political organization. Under the principle of subsidiarity, the world must in time become a central driver of bottom-up economic transformation. I am also in support of taking devolution to its fullest ex extent. <clears throat> I thank the Council of Governors for the well-organized format of this conference. And I know uh, the chair has mentioned two other things, apart from what I have mentioned, the issue of making county assemblies truly independent and financially so. Um, I think that is an aspiration and that is um, a concept that I share. And we will work with the necessary stakeholders and institutions to make sure that the Senate provides the framework for the independence of our county assemblies so that they can have their independent votes. Um, I know a matter has been also raised about uh, salaries and allowances. Uh, that is a very difficult one, I must admit, because um, the balance is between increasing the salaries of those of us who have jobs or creating opportunities for the four or five million who do not have a job. That is the conversation we, we must have. So it is quite a balance, you, are, you agree. So, apo tuta iko kizungumkuti kidogo na tuta ongea. What I want to promise you is that we are going to work with all the institutions because I have given, I have requested SRC to give us a proper advisory on the matters of salaries and wages. It is a subject that as a country 
we must confront. Um, we must know that from the president to the uh, 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 assistant uh, uh, at the office, we all work for the people of Kenya. We live in the same country. We take our kids to school. We provide for their upkeep, provide for their food. We pay the hospital bills, all of us. And therefore, pay must reflect the fact that we all serve the same people. And we have come to discover, for example, that there are people who have awarded themselves salaries. People in some parastatals, people in some other institutions, who earn more than the president. And you ask yourself, what is this job this fellow is doing? <laughs> that is so, you know, so, so there, there, there is a conversation we are going to have. So I want to tell my county members of, uh, members of county assembly, that is a conversation we are going to have, and you are going to be treated the same way members of parliament who are serving in the legislature will be treated. I further commend the organizers of this meeting for clarity of purpose with which they develop the headlines and the themes therein. It is time for us as a country to shift the gear into implementing devolution over the next decade. The authors and beneficiaries of devolution, who are also our sovereign employers, demand and deserve the highest possible value for their resources, which must be delivered without fail. It is therefore time to take measures to enhance efficiency and effectiveness and ensure that with respect to every policy program and project, the highest standards are achieved consistently. Inevitably, this requires us to finally usher in the performance management for high quality and sustainable service delivery in our counties. We know from experience that a robust performance management framework has enabled us implement the Vision 2030 and achieve other ambitious targets with greater efficiency. We have a duty to deliver the same benefits in our counties. The next phase of implementing devolution also requires us to think long and hard about the most fundamental variable in all development agendas, that is resources. Over-dependence on allocations is beginning to unfairly constrict the frontiers of productive possibilities for the devolved units and severely limit their horizons of transformation. We see counties as the most sustainable drivers of shared prosperity and bottom-up economic transformation. Our partnership with counties in implementing aspects of our agenda has enabled us accomplish a lot of positive outcomes and outline great possibilities for future partnership. The micro and small and medium enterprise sector, Juakali and other informal hustles agriculture, livestock, fisheries, beekeeping, and other economic activities can be transformed by increased support from county governments into sustainable pathways to higher earnings, wealth creation, and poverty reduction. The emergence of regional economic blocks and other inter-county collaborative mechanisms to kickstart broad industrial activity are a highly promising development. The possibility of consolidation and joint exploitation of opportunities also makes it possible to package competitive opportunities for local and international investors. All these opportunities have significant positive implication for county revenues and therefore revenues available for counties to implement transformation on a more ambitious scale. Of course, I must not forget to acknowledge the role played by our development partners, local and international investors, 
philanthropies, civil society, and other action groups, as well as volunteers and well-wishers who continue to support devolution and devolved governments. One of the purposes of devolution was not only to enhance participation and inclusion by promoting diversity, it was also to make marginalized communities and minorities to be centralized in our, in, our, in our democracy and to be properly represented and have opportunities to participate and benefit from it. We must therefore remain vigilant to ensure that this critical imperative is realized and to be ready to undertake robust affirmative action to protect women, to protect youth, the disabled, as well as minorities and marginalized people. In her clarion call for champions of devolution, the chair of the Council of Governors enumerated various challenges faced by devolved governments, and her assessment is fairly well considered. It is important that we endeavor to resolve these challenges, and I believe that a number of commitments and interventions I have canvassed above go some way towards addressing them. One item was conspicuously absent from the chair's list. It is well known, has a long pedigree, an equally formidable legacy of devastation. Kenyans agonize continuously over it and would like to witness decisive action to bring it to an end. It is poor governance and specifically corruption manifested through incompetence, negligence, poor professional standards, inefficiency, waste, mismanagement, and outright theft. I am happy that the plenum session set out good governance practice as one focal area for the attention of this conference because I have made my commitment to good governance and in particular decisive action against corruption very clear. On the 10th anniversary of devolution, we must use the 8th devolution conference to speak emphatically to an issue that must disturb all of us. As far as I can tell, it was never the spirit or intent of the people of Kenya to devolve corruption, mismanagement, and malpractice to counties. Yet, many counties have evolved into notorious epicenters of wanton looting, with everyone from the executive to the county junior staff implicated in a wild free-for-all at the expense of essential service delivery. Many innocent Kenyans are victimized, undeserved, or altogether neglected on a daily basis because of this devolved criminality. Counties must not become drivers of scandal, incubators of graft, or embezzlement hubs. The people of Kenya deserve better, and they must, they must be rid of this reckless betrayal we must liberate devolution from corruption. I speak about this with passion because it is a conversation I have equally had with my cabinet and my PSS and members of uh, parastatals. It is a conversation we have had. It cannot be business as usual, friends. And this fight, we have to lead it from the front. It causes mayhem and chaos in the delivery of public service. And Kenyans, across the board, from, all political, uh, from the entire political divide, want us to stand on the same side against corruption. I know they do. For this reason, we shall treat corruption at all levels of government as a high-priority law enforcement issue, 
requiring expeditious and decisive response. Regardless of position, office or status, any person implicated in the loss of public funds, whether in the national or devolved government, must encounter the punitive consequences of their action in full. I expect the agencies concerned to move with speed and attend to the many cases of corruption that are festering in many counties, including Wazengishu County. I wish to submit to this conference that we have a proven hack, a smart solution to kill the two birds of poor governance and efficient delivery of service with one stone. That hack is digitization and automation. I therefore encourage you, my friends, the good people who run our county governments, to embark on the journey of integrating digital solutions and ICT to service delivery and project implementation in your counties. We are open and we are going to support all the county governments to digitize their service. I am very happy that many counties have come forward to work with the ministry responsible, the ICT ministry and uh, the Ministry of Interior in making sure that we digitize all our services. I have also instructed um, the departments responsible to work with counties. If you need support in uh, matters of uh, um, raising revenue, digitizing the revenue space, we are going to work with you so that as we digitize services or collection of uh, uh, taxes at KRA and other areas, we are ready to work with the counties to make sure that we support the counties as is required of us by the law in making sure that you too are part of this digitization and automation process. Um, let me say, let me make a summary um, because um, let me make a summary in a very uh, short way of why, where I think what I have said in many words. There are five points which I want to put across to my friends, uh, leaders who are here. I know we have ministers here, we have governors here, and all our executives are here. We have PSS, we have CEOs, we have CECs, we have very senior staff from all our counties. It is said that you cannot do the same thing in the same way, over and over, and expect different results. It is actually a streak of madness if you expect anything different. So, as a country, we have a historic moment to take this country to the next level. I want to persuade governors who are here. We have a historic moment. I want to persuade ministers who are here and Kenyans who are listening to us. We have a historic moment as a nation to change the trajectory of our nation and to unlock the great potential that Kenya has always been and make it a reality for our people. And we just need to do a couple of things. Let, let me just give a few examples. Today, we import 520 billion of food items every year. Every year, from edible oil to wheat to sugar to uh, rice, you know, things that we can produce in Kenya. We must undertake, uh, my buddies, commoners, we must agree that it is time we have the human capital, we have the resources, we have the land to produce all these items 
in Kenya, save ourselves foreign exchange, improve the earnings of our farmers, and improve the general wealth of our population. Because this 520 billion is a market that we don't have to look for. It is a market that is already in Kenya. All we need to do is to produce and satisfy that market. So, edible oil, for example. I have had a conversation with many governors. I last had the last conversation with Governor Wanga from Homa Bay. We've had this conversation from Migori, uh, Homa Bay, Kisumu, uh, Siaya, um, Busia, Kakamega, Bungoma. We are spending 120 billion every year to import edible oil. We can produce this edible oil in Kenya. Those six counties, including the ones at the coast, from Lamu, Tana River, uh, Kilifi, uh, a bit of Mombasa, and Kwale, we can produce. And we are now working on a program, and I want to ask uh, my friends, the governors, to work with us so that we can stop importing products that our farmers can produce. Palm oil is one space we are going to work on with you. We have already identified where we are going to get the seeds. We want to work with you to get the farmers, to get the areas. We've already done a bit of work in that space, number one. Number two, sunflower. We are already importing seeds, 200,000 tons. We want to begin the planting. We have identified the counties, we've sensitized the counties to begin in October to plant for sunflower. Go down to canola, go down to um, uh, um, Sisem in, in, in Busia. Go down to um, uh, what is that other groundnuts and, and, and the rest of them. We have all that space to produce edible oil in Kenya. I want to encourage the counties who are here to work with us collaboratively. We are going to unlock a huge potential. Rice is one such. We have 120,000 acres in Tana River. We have an extra 20,000 acres in Kirinyaga. We have almost 20,000 acres in uh, Busia. We have another 20,000 acres in Ahero. We have almost 30,000 acres in Kucha. I think that must be in Migori. With 200,000 acres, we can produce 800,000 tons of all the rice that we today pay 70 billion shillings every year to import. The numbers are there, the farmers are there, we have what it takes to do all that. Let me also say something about sugar, which we are sorting out, cotton, which we are already disputing, um, uh, uh, which we are already disputing seeds, livestock. We have 640, 650 milk coolers that shortly we will be distributing to counties to support our dairy, make sure that dairy and milk is, uh, is of the quality that gives us more money. The whole space about leather and meat and what we are doing in that space. Good people, we must stop importing these 520 billion shillings every year that our farmers can produce in Kenya and we need to work together to make sure that that's not what happened. Number two, we need to agree on being deliberate and intentional about creating opportunities for our young people to find jobs and work. You heard my elder sister Meg, what she has, what she said here. By the way, many people may have been wondering whether she was talking about Kenya or another country. For your information, she was talking about Kenya. 
yeah? And we have managed, you've seen the list of investments that have been done in the last 12 months. And it is because we made a conscious decision to change some of our policies. When I made a commitment, when I went to the American Chamber, when I made a commitment that we are going to change our laws, we are going to change our policies to make sure that Kenya becomes investment friendly. Many people did not realize what we were, where we were going. Today, of all the nine or ten issues Meg put here, we have implemented 80, maybe 85 percent. We are remaining with one or two, which take a bit longer. And with that, we have seen an investment of close to beyond 200 billion in just the last 12 months in our country to create opportunities for jobs to drive away poverty. We must be intentional, um, my governors. We must be intentional about creating opportunities for young people in Kenya, for Kenyans to have access to work. That is why we are rolling out housing. And I am very happy we have a partnership with the counties on matters of housing because we, our intention is to create a million jobs from our housing plan. Number two, we are targeting, because when you heard the American ambassador say companies are giving accounts, witness accounts, that our Kenyan workforce, human capital, is the best globally, we must be deliberate about how do we harness this world-class human capital to drive our economy and to drive our progress. How do we do it? Number one, we made a conscious decision this year that we are going to invest more in sharpening that human capital by investing more in education. It is the reason why our budget this year on education went to 630 billion, the highest in the history of Kenya. Because that human capital cannot become what it is unless it is sharpened using training, education, knowledge acquisition. It is the reason why we have hired 50,000, 56,000 teachers. It is the reason why we have changed our funding model so that we make sure that it delivers much more accurately on the aspirations that we are looking for, on the skills that we are looking for. But we must be intentional about, as we invest in education and training of our human capital, we must be intentional on when they leave school and college and university, we must also be intentional on job creation. And for the first time, that is what we have done. We have been intentional. That is why we have the housing fund, so that we can generate a million jobs using our housing plan, number one. Number two, that is why we are intentional about digital jobs. You heard uh, the earlier presentations here. We intend to create another million jobs in the digital space. That is why we are going to be investing in at least an ICT hub in every ward. I want MCAs to listen to me. You must demand where is the ICT hub for your ward. We are working with the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the members of parliament, we are working with the ministry, so that we can have 500, 1,000 young people around our ICT hubs for digital jobs. We have huge opportunities for digital jobs. Number three, and before I go to number three, I have also asked our friends, the uh, county governors, that we also want to tap into the vocational training centers under the county governments. We want the vocational training centers to be also hubs of ICT. We would want to invest in at least an ICT hub in every 
vocational training center so that again we can train more, we can use technology so that this world-class human capital we have can work for the globe. Number three, we are working on making sure that this world-class labor we can export. And I want to thank many countries that have given us opportunity to export our labor. I have given very clear directions to my dear sister Florence. She knows what she must do for us to at least get a million exports of labor from Kenya, a million jobs. In our manifesto, we made a commitment that we want to increase our remittance from diaspora from $4 billion to $10 billion. That is a trillion shillings. That is going to be an opportunity for us to create jobs. And finally, on matters job creation, we have advertised, I think, the first 14 county aggregation and industrial parks. We have already gazetted, I think, five special economic zones. It is one of the conversations we had with the American Chamber of Commerce. You just had the opportunities. The American market alone is expecting more apparels from Kenya. That is why we are establishing a special economic zone in Busia, in Eldoret here, in, jo in uh, Naivasha, in Dongokundu, in uh, Sagana, in Del Monte, the, uh, down there. And we are looking for additional land so that we can increase the scope of our exports into the globe. We have huge markets waiting for our products out there. Those are areas of job creation. You just heard that with the little intervention we made, there is a new investment in Athi River that will create 20,000 jobs. These are opportunities. And I really want to have a conversation with the county governments so that they too can take up and pick up these opportunities and drive them. I wanted to be to say this, we must be intentional, we must be deliberate about creating opportunities for Kenyans to work so that we can improve their incomes and we can drive our progress. Number four, number three, sorry, partnership. My friends, governors, I, I'm, I'm really asking you to work with the national government. In this national administration, you have a partner and a friend. We have no intention whatsoever to take over any county function. We have no intention, and I want to say on this platform, all we want is to support the county governments for them to achieve their mandate and we will support you to the extent that you want us to support you. Yeah? Because uh, we, we do not want to take over any function. We want to help. Because the success of every county is the success of Kenya. Because we do not have citizens that belong to the national government. We have only one citizen. Those who elected you are the same who elected the national government. Sindio Wangwana. So, up on your Niko. So, um, issues like uh, UHC, we want to work with you. Community health promoters, we have already agreed on a formula. We will co-fund the 100,000 community health promoters. We are going to equip them as national government. We are going to work together to make sure that delivery of health products, health services is efficient and reaches the last mile, and counties are best place to do that. We need to work together on markets. As you have seen, markets is, uh, is run by counties. But as you also know, in my campaign, Mamamboga was front and center of my campaign. I simply cannot walk away from them. So I have to build these markets. 
and I, we intend to build 400 markets across Kenya, maybe 500. We're going to spend about 20 billion in building the markets. The markets will be handed over to the counties. You guys will run the markets the way you want. You will decide who is in those markets. You will discuss with us. And I'm looking for a partnership with you so that if you want to improve on the design, I am ready. If you want to improve some of the funding, I am ready. If you want us to change from here to there, sawa. Lakini soko to jenge. Because I saw in the presentation here, the women are saying, walikuwa wanalimu wanajua. So, nitawasaidia kupanga, kuweka shade everywhere, na kupanga hiyo, kuweka maali hiko stima, maali hiko eh, nini. Let's work together. Let's also uh, work together on matters to do with county aggregation and industrial parks. I must congratulate counties. We have a fantastic working relationship on county aggregation and industrial parks. They will be managed by counties. We will co-fund and they will run with it in terms of agro-processing, value addition, manufacturing around that space. We need to work together on distribution of fertilizer. I, I must commend many counties who have worked with us in providing the last mile delivery. As you are aware, we believe that counties have the capacity working with the national government to be able to deliver to the last mile. Let us work together on matters mitigating climate change. I'm very happy that today you overshot your uh, target of planting 2 million trees. I am told by the chair you planted 7 million trees. To Abige Makofi County is Yemen. They've done a wonderful job. That's the space. Work together on manufacturing. Work together on mobilization of revenue. You know, even as, I, even as the national government works hard to keep up to the schedule on paying on time for the shareable revenue, I want to encourage counties to also look at ways of own source of revenue. We are going to assist you so that you can meet your targets and we can do more around own source of revenue. All I am saying is partnership. Let us work together. Finally, we need also need to work together in mobilizing resources. As you are aware, we have made the conscious decision that we are not going to run our development, the affairs of our country, by borrowing debt left, right, and center. We are going to raise local resources. We need to work together to build local resources, to raise local revenue. We're going to work hard as national government. We are professionalizing KRA to raise more money. We are digitizing so that we can eliminate areas of pilferage. We are um, uh, increasing, as I made a commitment to this country, that we are going to be a country that is focused on saving for a very long time, we ignored the saving component. That is why, as a percentage of GDP, we are among the lowest globally. We are at less than 10%. Other countries are all the way to 50%. So we are going to do more with our NSSF. We are going to do more with savings so that we can save and be able to fund our own development using our savings. I want to encourage counties to work with us in that space. Let me finally um, have the saying that on source of revenue uh, and doing everything that we are going to do, the fifth thing I want us to talk about finally to agree on is on the subject I already mentioned of corruption. Good people, it is not going to be business as usual. I want to say this with clarity. It is not going to be business as usual. It cannot be the case that we lose revenue, that we cannot deliver public service, because a few people decided to go away with public money. It's not going to happen. It's not going to be business as usual. We will do whatever it takes. It cannot be that we are importing edible oil, we are importing all the other food items from uh, 
rise and, and everything else, as I said earlier, we have to have a paradigm shift. We need to invest in production. And I am very proud of our farmers. Our farmers, if there are any patriotic people in Kenya, it is our farmers. Just with the reduction of fertilizer from 6,000 something to 2,500, they have done an extra 200,000 acres of crop. If you see in Kenya everywhere, our farmers are doing a phenomenal job in producing food for us as a country. So instead of subsidizing that corner, we are going to be promoting production. I know there is, uh, I saw some uh, story today in one of the dailies who said we've gone back to subsidies on oil products. Let me tell the country that we will not go back to subsidies of any nature that distort things and causes us a lot of unnecessary leakage. If the nation newspaper would bother to understand the facts, we are making prudent and proper use of the petroleum development levy that is provided for in the law. It is meant to develop the uh, petroleum industry and it is meant to stabilize prices whenever we have unintended hikes. Instead of the nation commending us for using the petroleum development levy as was provided for in the law, they have decided to be negative. And that is how we suffer as a country. All the positive things that are made by our friends are destroyed by the very negative things that we say about our country. I hope that the, the nation newspaper has learned something from what Meg said and that they will stop this tirade against the people of Kenya and against the government of Kenya, unless they have another country that they belong to. I'm told they are owned by some people who don't live in Kenya. Maybe that's why they, they don't give a damn about what happens to our country. Um, let me finally, <laughs> I've said finally several times, but you have to forgive me. I am also in my hometown, so I am allowed to, to do a few things. Um, so I think we have, um, I have said everything I wanted to say. I am really happy that we are doing this. We are having this meeting of minds. I want to promise my colleagues, governors who are here, that uh, I have every intention working with them to promote everything they are doing. And whenever they need any support from me or from the national government, we will be ready. I know our development partners have done a phenomenal job in working with us to plug the gaps that occasionally exist. And I must commend them. I mean, I must commend our development partners. They have been a very useful resource for us as a government. And we will continue to work uh, with you. In a very special way, I must commend my elder sister, Meg Whitman. That lady is phenomenal. Hata njini mnakubali, huyu mama, hameongea kuliko sisi wote, ni kweli ya mazi kweli. Mbona tusimpigia makofi. Eh? Simameni, simameni tupigia makofi huyu mama. We must. Eh? To begin, my coffee with Mama and all our development. Thank you very much, Meg. You spoke, you spoke like the 50 million Kenyans, one person. So thank you very much, and thank you. I'm, and I'm, and I'm not saying this uh, to um, say anything else about the other people. Thank you very much, all our development partners. You have done a phenomenal job. We appreciate, and I speak so from my heart. On behalf of the people of Kenya, we appreciate your partnership, we appreciate your support, we appreciate your goodwill, and you can count on ours. Tafadhali tuketi chini. So, asanteni sana, ndugu zangu. Mimi na wapenda sana. I truly love you guys.
na nawatakia baraka ya Mungu hiyo maneno ingine eh, najua MCS wamesema wanataka kubuka appointment ya kuongea na mimi mimi niko tayari nishamwambia watu yenu ya kwamba unajua kuna maneno mengine tunaongea nyuma ya hema so hiyo maneno mengine tutaongea juu ya hema so na mambo ile ingine I, we will engage asanteni sana god bless you and enjoy your stay it is now my duty to declare the 10 years of devolution officially launched and i wish you wonderful deliberations and i look forward to receiving a report of the great job that you will do in the next three days asante nisan thank you very much your excellency and just two things your excellency that would like you to do and that is to launch the devolution book and then launch the joint county bankable investment book but we'll start with the devolution book on this side so I'll call upon the COG Executive Committee, the Chair of uh, LIGO, that's Governor Mutula, and USAID Ambassador Meg Whitman to just come and witness. Allow me to count you down as we wait for Ambassador uh, Meg Whitman and also uh, Governor Mutula Kilonzo to just come and witness. I'll count you down and what we have on this side is the launch of the devolution book which will then give details of uh, what the county governments have attained in the last 10 years so uh, kindly we may sit down please sit down so that we'll be able to see and your excellency i'll count you down so in five four three two and one Ladies and gentlemen, that is the devolution book. Your Excellency, with your permission, on this other side, we have the investment handbook. His Excellency will distribute a few books before we move to the other side where we have the launch of the bankable investment handbook. And the bankable investment handbook is basically what each county government has to offer to investors and partners that would like to be with His Excellency. I see His Excellency Mutula once assigned autographed book. Some of these opportunities are rare. We have one more book to launch, that is the County Bankable Investment Handbook, which is to the left of this dais. And after that, we'll have one photo or two photos, then after that we conclude with the National Anthem. So we'll proceed to the left, Your Excellency. There you go, that unique signature. Your Excellency, with your permission, if we may go this way, we, to the other side of the stage, where we have the County Bankable Investment Handbook. And this is basically what each county has to offer investments, in terms of investments and partners that would like to do that. So again, I'll count you down. If we can bring the buzzer closer, please. If we can kindly bring that buzzer closer. Ambassador, if we can bring that buzzer closer, please. And again, we'll count down to five and have that launch. So once we have every partner there, in five, four, three, two, one, and there we go. And that right there is the County Bankable Investment Handbook launched at the 10th Devolution Conference.
And there we have it. If I may now request that we have the governors kindly come and just arrange ourselves here. Would like to finish with a photo. If governors, we can quickly come on stage here. Governors, kindly if we come this way to the stage, we use these stairs just for the final photo before His Excellency may retreat after the national anthem. So if governors, we can kindly just come and arrange ourselves on these stairs so that we may take a photograph with His Excellency. After the photo, we have a gift that the COG would like to present to His Excellency, so please let's have that ready as well. All right, so after the photo session, we have a gift that will be... Pre After the photo, let's have the gift presented by the COG chair on behalf of the Council of Governors. Then I will request that we all exit the stage, leave His Excellency for the National Anthem after the gift.